Hello and welcome to Grace Life Honduras. We are a gospel-centered church family focused on reaching the unreached and making disciples. We pray that this teaching will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and discover more of the reality of Christianity. Hello everyone, great to be sitting down with you once again to be discovering more um, from the Word and from the Scriptures about the reality of our Christian faith. And the topic we were looking at is who God is, what is His nature. And the reason we're looking at this is that I hope to, through this series, bring you into a closer intimate relationship with God as your Father so that you can be bold in trusting that He is really good and only good. That is not just something we say as a Christian cliche, but that first of all, we really trust and believe in His goodness throughout scriptures from the beginning to the end, but also that we are able to give a reasonable answer for our faith when it comes to us believing that God is good. So grab a Bible, grab a cup of coffee or whatever you like to drink and let's get into the word. Um, I'm going to start with prayer. Father, we just want to thank you that as we spend this time digging into the truth and into the word together, that we will be able to see you um, possibly for some as they've never seen you before, but also, Father, for us um, individually and for us, us as a church at large, that we'll be able to see more clearly than ever before your heart for us as your beloved, and really that you are a Savior. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. I also pray, I just feel like this teaching and these teachings that they will bring real healing, like a healing balm to people's hearts who who have not been able to understand God, who wants to believe is good, but could not go far further until they started listening to some of these truths, Father. And as they discover more and more as we go through this, that they will see that from the word, that they actually can surrender and submit their life more and more because God is not like man. God truly is good and his holiness is his goodness. Amen. Okay, so we obviously most of the challenging scriptures we face is in the Old Testament as the Bible classifies Old Testament and New Testament. Um, I would normally like to say more like scriptures so because that is Genesis to Malachi. But um, we're going to start with some of the difficult things there. We already looked at some of them, not in too much detail. But today I'm going to start with the first one, first account that I really believe we need to stop and look at a bit. Um, and I kind of want to entitle this in judgment of God, because I do feel many times when we read things that are difficult to us in the Bible, we tend to stand in judgment of God. And the question is, as human beings, do we even really hold that right? Because we are not God. Praise God, we're not God. Um, but God's holiness, holiness meaning that which sets him apart, is his goodness. He is holy because he is good. Okay? And so that's what makes him so different from us. And so when we look at difficult scriptures, we have to start with the assumption that he is good. And then go to the story and sometimes instead of um, standing in judgment of God, we need to start standing in judgment of man, saying who is at fault here, God or man? And asking the simple question, what was God supposed to do? Was he supposed to just leave everything in the hands of, of evil men who decided to purposely set their hearts against the things of God? I don't think that's a righteous judge, and I don't think that's a righteous God. Yet I do believe that God is full of grace and truth, and we see this more, more clearly and most clearly in Jesus, but we can also see it in the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi. And so uh, my core or main verse for the series has been, and will continue to be Romans 12 verse 2, that says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, this is incredible that Paul says that what we need to renew our mind to is that God is good. 
What we need, what will bring transformation in our lives is when we renew our mind to the reality and the truth that God is good. His will is always acceptable and perfect. So this is really important for us and for those we love because it's not enough just that we really know that God is good and it's not just a Christian cliche we say, oh, God is good, yes, and all the time he's good, but that actually we can give answers to some of the places where it's difficult to understand because people out there need to know. Um, and sometimes people in the church need to know. I have found myself and I've been looking at this um, through the years for most probably about 15, if not you know, 15 years. Um, and before that, I had so many questions. And even till today, I don't have answers for all the scriptures. But that which I understand and that which I know, let's say from 90% of that, the fruit of my life has been incredible, specifically in my relationship towards God, my relationship towards others, and my relationship or understanding towards sin, that I do not have a desire for sin. Um, and it is because I understand, and I'm understanding every time I teach this and look at it, that God's goodness Seeing him for who he truly is makes man lose their desire for sin because you suddenly realize if you are born again, then you have become part of light and light. He is light and he is good. And that's what I want to reflect on the earth. That's who I want to show forth in my belief, in my actions, in my words, in my love for people and in how I walk with God. And so, um, yeah, so this has really been something that has been um, truly, truly impactful in my personal life and I know in the lives of many others. So the Old Testament scriptures that we struggle with, uh, we must bring that into light. And these are some of the things we have to bring into light. First of all, the prophet Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 18 verse 20 that the soul that sins, it shall die. We must also realize that Adam brought sin into the world. God is the creator of life and purpose, light and everything that is true, everything that is good, everything that is perfect. However, man decides to listen to the voice of the enemy and bring sin into the earth. And so um, sin is not God's idea. Sin is man's idea um, originating in the devil and man just brings it into the earth. And what comes with that is death. So also death is not the will of God. So we have to go through all these scriptures through the eyes of how it starts with. And that is that Moses has been asked by God to write down the, the first five books of the Bible, the scriptures, and that in these books, God is trying to bring a message to us. And the message is a message of who he is, that he is a God of salvation. We get to see that in this, these, um, these scriptures and in these um, stories that's being told or accounts that's being told, God is portraying himself as much as he can within the reality that now man has um, used his will against the will of God, choosing to listen to the voice of the enemy. And he was a murderer from the start, as it says in John 8. Um, Jesus says he was a murderer from the start. Now the human race who were supposed to bring the image of God, representing image on the, the image of God on the earth to the whole earth, to creation, to each other, as they were supposed to do this, they don't do this. And actually, because of man's sin, man's sin deserves death because it will never and can, can never carry the image of God and the will of God onto the earth. Sin is evil and God is not for sin. And so when we read the scriptures, we need to also be very careful when we go to the Bible that we don't read everything as if that is the perfect will of God. These scriptures are definitely inspired by God, written down through many men and many centuries, but it is an honest portrayal of what God shows us, what is the problem with man, where is the enemy at work and what his will is. However, as I explained last time, there are times, many times, where God's perfect will cannot play out the way he perfectly wills it because of man. He is a God 
Uh, he is God and he is sovereign, but that does not mean that he controls every single thing we do. And we see that clearly from scriptures. And one of the teachings I will do is will be entitled sovereignty so that we can look at that as well. Um, so we must realize that when we read these scriptures, it is not an account trying to tell us exactly this is the perfect will of God that we see in Jesus. Now there's reasons for that and we will explain that. But lots of the scriptures, specifically the Old Testament, but also in the New, but um, in the Old, more predominantly, especially in the first five books, we actually get to see what happened because man chose a will which was not the will of God. That doesn't mean that God's will changes. His perfect will is to bring salvation. He still wants us to eat of the tree of life, which we know now is Jesus. He still wants us to choose him. He still wants us to choose life. However, man Man's will has an effect on the plans of God. Okay, so as we then go and look at a part of scripture that can be difficult but shouldn't be, is Genesis 6. And this is where the flood happens. Now, first of all, we have to fundamentally realize that this was not God's perfect will. Um, start there. Okay, we read it as if there's no alternative. Secondly, we need to realize that this is what has happened because of what has happened with man on the earth. Third of all, we need to realize that Moses is writing these, this book and he is bringing elements into the book of Genesis, which the people who lived in that time did not even know. So remember, this is most probably 1,200 to 1,500 years after the events that's happening. Um, and so now Moses is writing and he is almost like filling in the picture which the men of old didn't know, that as it was happening, they didn't know certain things. We read it as if they knew. But this is Moses writing to a gener generations and generations later, saying there's some things, some details in the story, that as we heard it, um, this um, we need to know now that maybe we didn't see it the way it was uh, supposed to be, because we didn't have the full revelation, we didn't have the scriptures. And so we must remember that. So in verse five, we're going to in we're going to start in Genesis six, Genesis six verse five. Then the Lord saw that the wicked man, whoa, that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So now, is God a righteous judge? Does God know the heart of man? This is not man. Who is judging man? This is not man saying, oh, I can see that that person is evil. No, this is God himself by the inspiration um, or Moses pinning God's thoughts in the scriptures and saying that the Lord looked at man. And this is what was happening. He is the righteous judge. He is the one who knows the innermost part of our being. And this is what it says. The wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually so who is distorting the image of god on the earth god or man man is okay now watch the next scripture the lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart wow noah didn't know that you'll see that uh, as we continue to read Moses writes this because the Lord is trying to show us what was really happening here on the earth. It shows us two conditions of the heart as well. Look at the difference. Man's condition of their heart was that their thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. And yet God's heart was grieved. This is really interesting. Okay, Man's heart was filled with evil. God's heart was filled with grief. Now the Lord says, I will wipe out or blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. So we see here that um, he was planning to bring everything to an end. Everything. Okay? But verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord is speaking to himself now. This is showing Trinity as we saw in Genesis 1. He is already revealing himself as a triune God, as a God 
who is not just the standalone God, he is one, of course, but within himself, he has three personas, the spirit and the son. And what he's saying is the entire creation will have to be brought to an end because it's true, the soul that's in must die. However, one man, one man finds favor with the Lord and everything changes. Now it says, these are the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Okay, now we know that no person is perfect until Jesus. So it's not meaning that Noah was perfect in action um, all the time. We also know after the flood, Noah definitely was not perfect in action. But what he made him perfect is that he was blameless in his time. And Noah walked with God, which was one of the only who walked with God. Let's let's look at it further to show that. Now Noah became the father of three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Now is this the will of God? Was this what he told man to go and do, to go and multiply on the earth and do this? They were corrupting the earth. We think today and in today's time that things are corrupt and that things have um, become really evil. And I agree 100% of the time. But this was something that we've never seen before. Um, the intent of man's heart continuously owned me towards evil. And we're going to prove that even more as we read into this scriptures, okay? And then um, there in verse 13, now for the first time God speaks to Noah. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Then he explains how to build the ark. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of that just because of time. Go to verse 17. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of the water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be a male and a female. And then he continues to say there's also those who are for food and for offering. So it's more than two by two, by the way. But what I want you to see from there is that um, the failure was not on God's side. The failure was on man's side. Man was corrupt. Man was corrupting the earth. Okay. And now because of Noah being found favor, Noah finds favor with the Lord because he was walking with the Lord. Watch. Noah's righteousness actually um, saves the creation on earth. That's incredible. Because now God says, okay, take with you all the animals. Wow. Okay. Isn't that encouraging that Today, if you were to go out and let's, for example, say there was this that God would say, like, I've decided the world's coming to an end unless I have more people who are seeking me. Um, if I was to go out here in Albania, which is a country that has only about 2% Christians, um, you would find at least one, at least 10. You would find at least 100. I've met them, you know, who believe in the Lord and who walk with the Lord. And so, wow. If one could do this, imagine how, because of faith, because of the church, because of what we're doing on earth, what you might be doing and standing in faith for what you believe in God for, standing in faith in your family situation, how that's turning things around. Okay, that's incredible. Now, now God will not do that today. We are going to get into all of that. But Jesus said, God says at the end of the story of Noah, you can read that for yourself, that he will never destroy the earth like this again. And we know also with the coming of Jesus that we are under, um, under his promise that if we will receive salvation, then we have passed from death into, we have passed from death and from judgment into the marvelous light of the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, um, God says this to Noah, and Noah doesn't argue with God, okay? Now, we struggle with the story, and we judge God, and we speak about, like, how could he have done this? Yet Noah, who was alive then, he does not argue with God, meaning he most probably saw that what God is doing is righteous, because he knew the people as well. Now, does Noah know 
that the Lord was grieved in his heart. No, this is recorded for our benefit. Praise God. Okay, so the ark is incredible in size. As we saw there, you can go and read it on your own. Incredible in size. And it is estimated that the ark could take anything between 50 to 75 years to complete. Possibly shorter, depending on how many people were involved in building the ark. Because it could have been more than Noah and his family. Although Noah holds responsibility for it by God. In this time, Noah was preaching righteousness to the people. Listen carefully. He was building an ark in the middle of a desert. Back then, we didn't have phones and internet and things like that. People told each other what was happening. It is completely possible that the news could have spread all through the known world about this work that was being done here. And it reminds us of what Jesus says in his time on the earth when he says in John 5, 36 and John 10, 25, that the works he does testifies about his message. The same thing was happening here. Noah's work of the ark, building the ark, was testifying. It was a message to the world to come to God. We read it as if God decided only Noah and his family was to go onto the ark. If one person believed in all that time, of course God would have said, get into the ark. Look at Rahab. Um, when we look at the story later, for those who know the story, go and look it up. But um, the whole her whole oh, her whole community is destroyed, and yet she is saved because she believes. That is incredible. However, in fifty to seventy five years of a massive boat being built and Noah preaching righteousness to the people, he was every time someone stopped about stopped asking him what are you doing, he would explain what happened. And you know what they did? They mocked him. In all that time, not one person turned to the Lord. Look at the hardness of man's heart when they turn away from God. If you were to give anyone, any preacher, 50 years to preach, okay, a message that has signs and wonders because Noah's building a boat, 50 years, and nobody comes to the Lord. That doesn't happen today. You are talking about a whole different kind of um, reality that God was dealing with here. Look at 2 Peter 2 verse 5. This is so incredible. It jumps in the middle of a scripture, but you'll get the point. And did not spare that. So God did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others. When he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly, he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. But those who were godly, and look, Noah's faith in God even meant that God was kind and merciful towards his family. And I choose to believe that Noah actually instructed his sons also in faith. Not that they might have been perfect, but I choose to believe that he did instruct them. But his children with the seven others and the people who were working, um, or his family, sorry, not the people working with him. Um, and they all, every time someone would come to his wife or to his sons, he, they would all say, this is the message. This is what God has said. You either come with us or you are part of the destruction. This is the same message that Jesus gives when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. What was this? This was an act of God's kindness and mercy and patience as he was drawing man to himself through building this ark to say, come unto me. But the only way out of this perverse, ungodly generation is to come to the boat. And nobody came. Isn't that sad? That's sad. Okay. Um, let me just have a drink of water. Okay, so um, he said that he, I'm going to, in verse 17, he says that he will bring the flood. And um, in verse 22, so Noah did these things according to everything that God had commanded him. So he did. Isn't that incredible? What great faith. Man who walked with God. And he says, God says it, he does it. Amen. Let's be like that. In Hebrews 11, verse 6 to 7, he is actually one of the people named in the, um, as the Old Testament uh, heroes of faith. 
And without faith, it is impossible to please him, God, for the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world. The work Noah was doing was condemning the world because they refused to come. Not God. The work Noah was doing was already condemning the world. Why? Because they did not come. Okay? Many scriptures are coming into my heart now, what Jesus also said. But, and he became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. This is the same message. Listen, Moses is writing to tell us that it does not have things that our relationship with God is not connected to our behavior, but our faith in God. Because of Noah's faith in God and his walk with God, he was able to do the things of God. There's the power. Believe in God, walk with God, have a relationship with God, and your works will testify that you have relationship with God. That is really awesome. Now, so God does bring the flood onto the earth, and we see that only him and only his family is saved. And today we can see that same thing when we look unto Jesus that God is not unrighteous, just as he was not unrighteous in doing this and flooding the earth. But God is righteously saying, I have made a way. His, the, his way is put your faith in Jesus to save you. As Noah put his faith in God to save him through the ark, so we put our faith in Jesus to save us. Okay, When we put our faith in Jesus, we are escaping the corruption of the world. Isn't that powerful? And there's so much more to say, but you know what I love is that in Genesis 8, verse 21 to 22, um, what no, the flood has um, now finished, the land is dry, Mo, uh, Noah gets out and builds, uh, offer like a, a, not a sacrifice, builds an altar to the Lord. And the Lord smells this aroma and he says, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. God makes a new covenant and he puts a bow in the clouds, the rainbow, to confirm this covenant. And in Isaiah 54 verse 7 to 10, if you go and read it, he, we see that these days are like those days where we are under this covenant of protection where God says, never again will I do this. You know, but one day, Jesus is coming back and it will be like the days of Noah. But when you read scriptures like Matthew 24 or Luke 17, when you go and look at them and it, he says like, it will be like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the son of man be. Let it encourage you. First of all, when you've put your faith in Jesus, you are not counted among those men or women. Okay. First, that's first of all. Secondly, we can see that this is not God coming with vengeance and nobody knew. Noah was preaching the message that God gave him, come and be saved for 50 to 75 years. Nobody came. So of course they were just continuing with their life. They were mocking God, not just mocking Noah. They were mocking God's way of creating a way out of the corruption. They were mocking it. And so they continue with what they were doing. But Noah had no fear when the flood came. Why? Because he had a relationship with God. He had put his faith in God and he had done the works of God. Now, when we go to God as a God who loves, as a God who is full of grace and full of truth, and the God who is also the judge of all living things, we can have confidence and boldness knowing that we have in our relationship with him the confidence of salvation. We have been saved not by works, but by the gift of grace through faith in his way of making us right with him through the Son. So when Jesus comes back, it's not going to be a day of great fear for us who believe, but a day of great rejoicing because our husband has come back. Our Savior has come back and there will be a final judgment. Um, and that is true.
but we do not need to fear him in that kind of fear. Be blessed, and if you have any questions or comments, please send them our way. Also, if you have not decided to make Jesus Lord of your life yet, I want to challenge you and ask you, why not? What's stopping you? And please make contact with us so that we can walk with you and help you to discover the truth of who he is so you too may become part of his family and enjoy not just salvation here on earth, but salvation for eternity through Jesus. Amen. You can find more of our free teachings on our website, www.gracelife.co. And if you're ever in the Duras area, we invite you to join us for one of our gatherings. Our aim is to help you discover Jesus, find family, and experience life. To contact us or to find out where and when we meet, visit our website, www.gracelife.co.